Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Hummingbird Hour. We are so glad you are here with us today. I am delighted to be joined by one of my friends and thought partners and colleagues and uh, someone I met during the pandemic. We've never met in person yet, but we're going to fix that um, soon enough, hopefully. Um, and uh, we're, we're going to get started here in just a minute. Uh, so we just wanted to, to give everyone a chance to join the room and join the space. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And uh, I, I am, uh, I've moved to a new place. Um, and so hopefully my, I'm using a hotspot because I don't have internet yet. So hopefully the, uh, the hotspot will serve us well. Um, and if I disappear, you are in good hands with Carly and I promise to return. Um, so, okay, well, let's go ahead and officially get started. Again, happy Tuesday. Welcome to Hummingbird Hour. Hummingbird Hour is the weekly conversation series that we're running um, at Hummingbird Humanity in May, June, July uh, to celebrate our one year anniversary. I still can't believe we started this journey together in May 2020 um, as, we, um, as we were all navigating the pandemic. Um, and I am um, delighted that the journey has continued. I, I'm so, so grateful that I uh, get to um, continue to impact hearts and minds and make the world a better place for all of us. Um, and I'm so grateful to all of you who are with us today to share in um, uh, this continuing conversation as we, we all think about how do we take care of ourselves and how do we take care of the humans in the world around us. Um, and um, I'm delighted uh, today to be joined, as I mentioned, by Carly Hauck, uh, who is a new friend of mine that I met during the pandemic um, and uh, is someone that I've gotten to know well and we share a number of the same values and beliefs, um, but we also approach this work differently. So uh, Carly, I'm so glad you're with us today. Thank you for inviting me, Brian. I'm really happy to be here. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I knew that when I, we had the series, I knew that you had to be with us. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, I should mention, I'm Brian McComick. I'm the founder of Hummingbird Humanity. Um, and I, um, I have a long career in human resources and diversity, equity, and inclusion. And really what I, uh, what I believe is my core expertise is, is really change, driving change, leading change, managing change. Uh, and, uh, and now I do that, that, that work of, uh, of driving and leading um, and hopefully influencing and inciting change centered around um, human-centered workplaces. Uh, and how we create places that work for all of us, um, and uh, both inside of the company as well as those the communities that that our companies serve and that serve our serve our companies and organizations. Um, and uh, so that's just a hint about me. But today is really about our special guest, Carly. Uh, so Carly and I met through a mutual friend, Jennifer Brown, uh, who I think uh, many of you may know as well. Jennifer has uh, been a mentor to me and has, um, you know, as you know, as someone who is new, uh, well, I guess I'm not that new anymore to the diversity and inclusion space. But when I was new to the space, uh, Jennifer was very welcoming and warm to me and opened doors and uh, sort of pointed me in the right direction uh, here and there and uh, has helped me to be, be who I am today. Um, and so she met, she introduced me to Carly because she knew that we had these shared values. And Carly just earlier this year released her book, Shine, um, which is, I'm like, when I read the pit table concepts, Carly, I'm like, yes, 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 all the things, all the things, I love it. So Carly, you you have, um, and I will, I will, I, I would love to do your, your biography justice, uh, but I, but that you're an educator, you are a well-being leader, you are um, someone who you know, really values the environment as well as 
uh, the, the the humanity and you know that lived on this planet. So, would you just share a little bit about you and what brings you to the space? And then and then after that, if you want to, if you want, I you know one of the things I love that you do, and I know I want to learn from you more about is how we ground ourselves as we enter spaces. So maybe you can do that as part of your introduction is help us ground ourselves. I would love that. Thank you. Yeah. So I. Um... I started my business in 2010. It's an organizational and leadership development consultancy. And we have worked with some really amazing organizations like LinkedIn, Pixar, Cliff Bar, Genentech, Asana. So small to mid-sized um, organizations, high growth startups. And typically I've really partnered with HR business partners around a variety of different things. I've really customized trainings, large scale programs like inclusive manager development programs, communication trainings, trainings on emotional intelligence, self-awareness, um, how to be an ally, things like that. And that um, has been a lot of the work that I've been doing within companies. And so also really being a change agent uh, coming from the outside in. And then I have had the privilege and joy to be adjunct faculty at Stanford and UC Berkeley's Haas School of Business. And I've taught probably over seven different courses related to leadership um, for the last eight years I've been at Stanford and two or three at Haas. And so that's, um, that's really fun for me. I, I tend to be a bit of a nerd. So <laughs> it's a great community because I get to bring in my love of research and evidence base. Um, I also have actually contributed to two uh, NIH funded clinical trials where we're looking at the long-term benefits of mindfulness as it relates to resiliency to stress, to cortisol, to emotional uh, intelligence, to empathy, to disease. And so I bring that lens into my work as well because I believe that the system of being a human, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this because this is kind of the orientation of my book, is directly related to the system at work. So like if I am imbalanced in my body, in my system, then that imbalance actually shows up in how I lead myself and how I lead others. And it has a ripple effect into the greater world and therefore then into the planet. And so Brian, you know, you mentioned the planet. Um, I feel really passionate about supporting leaders in business to prioritize people and planet first, not profit, because I feel like that is part of the disease that, um, that I think most of us are very aware of when we look at the racial inequities, when we look at, you know, businesses that are aligned with human trafficking um, or are depleting the rainforest. Like it doesn't have to be that way. And so when we think about, you know, how do we want to lead and what is business really standing for? I feel like there is this rebuilding, this revisioning of business in the world right now that we have the opportunity to really look at the long view. What do we want to create together? And that was a real impetus for me writing the book. So that was a long intro, but um, that gives you a, a sense of, of me. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Well, and um, and we're gonna we'll, we're gonna ground ourselves in a minute because I can't miss that part of the session. I one love thing that, that. that yeah, one thing that comes to mind for me though, Harvey, is um, as you know, I'm writing a book myself, and um, and about what is it what does it look like to create human centric workplaces that work for all of us, and uh, and I have to give you credit because you know I, when I when I part of what I say in the book is I. Um, I can't do it alone. Like none of us can. None of us can think about all the things. None of us are experts on everything, uh, or all of the different lived experiences, or on the things about our planet and our environment. And um, in my first draft of the outline, I had not referenced the environment or our planet um, in human-centered workplaces. And it was after a conversation you and I had a few weeks ago. And I have a writing partner who's helping me. And I, I, I called her. Her name is Kristen. And I said, Kristen. 
Carly just reminded me we have to make sure the environment and the planet is part of this because humanity exists in that in that environment. And uh, she's like, absolutely. And so you know, I'm grateful to people like you who expand my thinking and perspective. Um, and I think this, you know, what you're going to do for us in just a moment, you're helping us stay grounded as just humans. Um, and when you bring when you invite people into spaces and this reminder of the importance of the planet we live on and how we're connected with the energy of that planet, I think is so is so important and can easily get lost in corporate spaces because it certainly has gotten lost at times in, in my journey. Um, so thank you for that. Would you like to, to, to help us get grounded as we're all here all together right. today? Yeah, well, I thank you. You had shared that with me. I'm so glad um, that 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 inspired you to kind of bring that into your message as well. Yeah, we we are of the earth. We are not separate. So if if she is not flourishing, we are not flourishing. Um, so with that, I'd love to just bring everybody into a more quiet and reflective space. So if it feels comfortable for you, you can close your eyes or you can just kind of gaze downward. And really, we're just bringing the attention inward. So just allowing yourself to notice your body, notice where your feet might be contacting the floor, where your body is contacting the chair. And then just start to notice the rhythm of your breath. And as you breathe in, feel the stomach rise. And as you breathe out, feel the stomach fall. So we are intentionally slowing down our blood pressure, our heart rate, allowing our nervous system to move from the potentially sympathetic, which is the, you know, the more fast pace, fight flight potentially we could associate with to the rest and digest the parasympathetic. So breathing in, breathing out, letting go of everything that came before all the to do's and just knowing that this moment is the most important being right here. And so just letting your breath be the anchor to being right here. And if it's helpful for you, you can just in your mind quietly say in, out, in, out. And as you're sitting and breathing, let's just pretend that we're outside. Find your favorite park, or outside space, just imagine it. I have a real affinity to trees. So I'm gonna bring that in to this guided visualization as we're breathing, as we're being here. I'd like for you to imagine that your favorite tree is behind you and you're sitting at the base of this tree and you're leaning your back against the tree and your feet are planted on the earth and just pretend that you don't have shoes on and I'll tell you why in a moment. So we're sitting, breathing, grounding our feet into the earth, feeling our body supported by the tree, by the earth. And as we are aware of the tree above us. We're aware that the leaves, the branches are protecting us from storm, from fire. We are being sheltered by the earth. And just as our feet are grounded into the roots, the tree is corresponding to all other trees, all other life. There is a system of communication happening to support balance, homeostasis. So coming back to the breath, just as you're slowing down your breath, you're coming into more balance, more equilibrium. And let's just stay here together for another minute. Breathing in, 
breathing out. Allowing the body and the muscles to <clears throat> release and relax. Softening any places that are tight or tense. And no matter what is happening <clears throat> in your life that feels maybe a little bit more challenging to navigate, you can always come back to this image and just know that you are being supported right now. Feel your feet on the floor. Imagine the tree behind you supporting you to be strong, to be courageous, to be in balance. Because when we are prioritizing that self-care, coming into a more calm, strong place inside of us, we are able to show up in the best of ways at work and in the world. And that's part of being a conscious, an inclusive leader, which we'll talk about later today. So in our last few moments, just bring your awareness to gratitude. What do you feel grateful for in your life right now? Let yourself take that in. Your health, your opportunities, your family, your home, whatever it may be. What are you grateful for? coming into the abundance in your life. And then when you feel ready, opening your eyes, coming back. And one thing I like to invite is to actually just kind of look around the room because we've been in this deeper unconscious space. And so you don't want to just look right at the Zoom camera. You're kind of letting yourself integrate, reorient, come back. Maybe even do some movement, some stretching, coming back into the body. Ah, thank you. That was so yummy. Thank you, Brian. Absolutely. Thank you, Carly. You know, the, um, as I'm still re-emerging from that, that space, um, I, I was, uh, I had a, a brief thought there around, um, that conscious and inclusive. And I, I was thinking like we could just drop the ands and say conscious inclusive. Um, and uh, cause I, I, I do, you know, you know, one of the things that we, we will teach in some of our programs is, you know, we are all subject to bias and we're all subject to those messages. And our own, the only way to break the bias is to be first of all, to own and be aware that we are biased. Um, and then the second is to be conscious and intentional about making decisions that aren't that are not as best we can to not influenced by that bias so you have to be conscious and present and and actually when i think about what you just did with us and for us there is it's a reminder for me of something we we, we talk to leaders about is um you just sometimes you have to, have to take a pause um because when we're moving quickly is when we're most apt to let our bias take over um, and influence our decisions. And it's when we're grounded and we're intentional and thoughtful and um, fully present is when we can be aware that bias might be sort of creeping in here. Um, so I don't, you may have some thoughts there um, before, I, before I move on to our first question. 
Yeah, well, I mean, there's been a lot of research that shows that folks that have a regular meditation practice, which is really what we just did. So meditation supports us to be mindful. So they're not the same. A lot of folks will get them confused when we meditate, which is when we're sitting, when we're being just like what we were doing, that enables us to bring our full attention to the present moment. And when we, again, have a meditation practice, we can be mindful of our bias much more because we have greater awareness. But folks that don't have a meditation practice, they're not going to be as mindful and they're not going to be as aware of their bias. So they go hand in hand. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Well, and I love, I also really appreciate, um, and I, I don't think I'd fully, fully um, recognize this, that you come from a research perspective. And I, as I often say, I'm, I'm a true like, pra like practitioner. I'm about like living and experiencing. And, um, but I know that it's helpful to be balanced with people who have the research and act like that more sort of detailed understanding of these things. Cause they, they, they're, it's, it's a yin and yang of how we, how we come together. So with that in mind, I'm curious to see how we're going to answer this first question of, you know, we, we've titled this, con this session Conscious and Inclusive Leadership. Um, and so I think it feels right to maybe just start with, what do, what do you think is a conscious and inclusive leader? Um, what, how do you define that for yourself, Carly? Thank you. Yeah, well, I feel like a conscious, inclusive leader, I'm going to take the and out. I love that invitation is someone that has committed themselves to doing the inner work, so to speak. Um, and that translates to building this strong inner game, which we'll talk about, but they're, they're willing to look at their blind spots. They're willing to take personal responsibility. They are aware that they're gonna make mistakes. Um, they're trying as best they can to come from a place of empathy, of integrity, um, where they're aligning with their values, where they're willing to be courageous, to speak up against harm, injustice, uh, where they are leading from greater vulnerability. And there's so much more I could say about it, but I'll, I'll pause there. That feels, that feels like enough right now. So, well, I think that there's so many layers to this definition too, right? Which makes this um, a, um, you know, when I think about the, the work, so if, if, we, if you would have asked me eight years ago, of, um, which is just before I started my career more officially in DEI, do I have a good understanding of diversity, equity, and inclusion work and the skills needed and the expertise needed for, as a practitioner or as a leader or as an HR professional, which is, which is where I worked. And I, I worked as an HR person for many years and I had responsibilities that were in the diversity and inclusive inclusion space. Um, and certainly I believed in, in the importance of that work as a gay man and a person with a disability. And, um, when I started doing this work, I realized, and I continue to realize, oh my gosh, I don't know what I don't know. Um, and so, um, and so I, you know, this akin to what I shared with you, shared earlier at the beginning of the call of the, like the importance for me of having others who help broaden my perspective, open, you know, give me new lenses to consider. And I think that's a really important part of being a conscious, inclusive leader is, is that conscious awareness that wait, I don't have all the answers, um, that humility of acknowledging that I don't have all the answers, that um, practicing vulnerability and sharing, I come to something new or that, or asking questions or asking, you see, sometimes asking for help. Um, and, uh, um, and I think, and those are things that I've had to really practice and be thoughtful about. Um, and like, particularly that last one, I, I'm still getting better about asking for help. Um, and, you know, starting this new adventure with Hummingbird Humanity has been a real practice with humility of like, I've never run a business before. I've never, I wasn't a consultant before for my career. I now work in a space where people trust me to be, to, to enter their, their spaces. And I want to be able to bring 
uh, be helpful as best I can because I my job is to be of service to all of the, the people in that community. And I think all of those things, leaders need to find their own way to harness so much of that. And I, well, I share those stories with the hope that they're helpful for others and particularly for leaders as they're they're leaning into how, how do they become a conscious, inclusive leader? Mm -hmm. Great answer. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, you know, and you, you mentioned this earlier, you wrote a book, Shine. Um, I love the cover and I must have, well, do you have a copy near you? Um, I didn't bring one with me because I'm I'm not at my normal home right now either. I'm in Oregon, but um, <laughs> I could, we could, yeah, I could pop a photo in the chat if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. And I love, I just love the cover of the book. It just, it just brings joy every time I see the cover. And I apologize that I don't have my copy. Okay. Um, I, for those of you who weren't here at the very beginning, I, uh, I'm, I just moved into a new house on Sunday. So my stuff is all over and I'm still trying to get it organized. So definitely check out Shine and we'll make sure we, we, um, add the link uh, to, to the chat for the Amazon link. Um, you know, but I, I know that- well, you know, And I might interject to, to try to actually, if you can buy it from your local bookstores because um, while Amazon is doing some good things in the world, we need to support small businesses and they took a big hit last year. So if I'm sure you have a link to my book page and there's lots of different booksellers that people can choose, whatever, whatever your choice is. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, Carly. Yeah, actually, I, I often default to Amazon because it's just so easy. Um, but similarly, we actually um, oftentimes, and we can try to find this as well and put it in the chat, we actually try to recommend, um, Oprah um, shared a list of black owned bookstores. So we try to elevate them whenever we can as well. And I love the expansion to your small local bookstore and to give them the business. I love that idea. Totally. So I know that Shine is very connected to this conversation we're having around conscious inclusive leadership. So would you tell us about just the messages and the, the heart of what Shine is about? Sure. Well, I really think of it as a how to be a conscious, inclusive leader. And basically, you know, in the last 10 years and working with lots of different leaders, managers, individual contributors, I was seeing this theme of folks that had certain qualities that they brought in an integrated way which enabled them to really lead themselves and others through volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, a lot of what we've been going through in the midst of the pandemic, but also that we go through during like a really big reorg or, you know, big, big changes and transitions. And some of us might have learned, you know, it's important to grow our self-awareness or our emotional intelligence, right? But what I kept seeing again and again is that there were these six qualities that when really practiced in unison, when we were developing this more integrated system, we had a new operating model for how we let ourselves and others. And I started writing Shine four years ago, but I really have been developing the aspects of the book for the last decade um, in my work with leaders. And these qualities that I was seeing, I was also promoting in the trainings that I was being asked to deliver and in the manager development programs and in how to be an effective communicator and whatnot. And so when I think about the complexities that we have in our world, you know, um, systemic racism, climate change, just so many things, right? It can feel overwhelming. And I think that that requires that we have a really strong inner game to be able to meet the rapid changes that we keep having to really, um, you know, really figure out, navigate, collaborate, innovate around. And so those inner qualities are self-awareness, emotional intelligence, resilience, which we could think of as a growth mindset. So when something challenging happens, instead of saying, why is this happening to me? Instead, how is this for me? How can I grow from this? Um, how are we prioritizing well-being, which is actually saying no. It's aligning with um, 
like what's good for this body, mind, and heart, and then being able to actually then check in with our fellow team members, with our friends. How are you? You know, how are you taking care of your mind, body, heart, so to speak? You know, how are you prioritizing well-being? Leading from love versus fear. And then lastly, um, authenticity. So when those six are really being cultivated together, we're able to show up on the outside with more inclusion, with more courage, with the ability to really remeasure success. So that again, it is prioritizing people and planet and not just what's in it for me or having profit be the driver there. And so it's really about how do we create a workplace and world that works for everyone, but more importantly is living in greater harmony with the planet because we haven't been doing that. And that is what is needed. So that's that's the essence of the book. It's a big book, it's a big message. Um, I really showcase nine leaders and their journey and their embodiment of these skills and how that shows up when they are leading. And all the leaders that I highlight in the book, they're incredible humans, incredible people, and they're very committed to their businesses aligning with social responsibility and environmental responsibility. So we could think of it more as like the traditional B Corp, which is business as a force for good. I love it. I love it. I love that you're like, it's just a little small book with just a few little things in it. It sounds like there's a lot there um, and really powerful. Uh, you know, that the, uh, the one of the examples that you shared there reminds me of, um, I, uh, you know, I used to read, um, so I, I have sometimes my, my mind, it does, isn't kind to me. And so I have to choose to take steps to help uh, keep my mind in a good place. And so, sometimes that is that, that victim mentality of like, why is this happening to me? Um, and I, I, and there have been periods of time in my life where, cause that's not how, who I want to be or how I want to show up. And so I've, uh, the don't sweat the small stuff books I love and um and there's some great messages in there of like how do you reframe your thoughts um and uh, I used to read one uh, or one or two of those sections every day on my way to work of like okay I need to reframe my thoughts and um and one of my favorite ones is um there's this one example of anecdote of uh, of a um person who yeah. runs out of gas um, and they're driving, they're driving their car, they run out of gas and they have to walk a mile to fill up their gas tank to put up gas gas in their car. And it's the anecdote is like, okay, well, most of us when we hear that picture is like how frustrating, how annoying, all of the things, right? Like, which is true. And by the way, we can be human and say like, this is, this sucks. <laughs> um, and um, what the anecdote suggests is, but I could also flip that and say, but I'm really fortunate, I have a car. I have money to buy gas. I have the ability, the mobility to walk to the gas station. I have, you know, whatever it may be, you can find those ways to, um, cause you know, it, it, you know, there's, there's a lot that we can all be grateful for. And uh, so I like that reframing cause I think it's so important. Um, and particularly over the last year, well, year plus, um, although many of us could say, well, yes, and life has been hard too. Um, but the last, you know, with the pandemic and with so much that's happening in the world right now, um, I think these these conversations about how do we bring, um, you know, the language I often use is humanity in the workplace, um, or, you know, like as this, this conversation is titled Conscious Inclusive Leadership, which I think are very similar um, in, in nature. You know, what is it that, you know, why was this the right time? You mentioned you started the book a few years ago. Why was this the right time for you to release the book and to share this message? Um, and, you know, I know you've navigated, you and I have both been nomad, nomads during the pandemic and trying to find our way through the world. So um, I'm sure some of it's personal, but it's also about what we see in the world around us. Yeah. Um... <laughs> I mean, I never wanted to write a book, <laughs> honestly. Um, my first semester at Stanford, I, I got asked and I thought, okay, well, uh, who has time to write a book? In fact, that's what I said when I got asked. And I was still really grinding, like really trying to kind of make it as a consultant and entrepreneur, even teaching at Stanford. 
um, as adjunct, you know, faculty doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that there's a huge financial stability there. And I decided to start writing and to start blogging. And um, my writing was was getting a lot of acclaim and acknowledgement. And so two years later, after I'd been writing for a while, I got asked again. And I thought, okay, let's try it. And it was quite a journey, but the impetus for me to really start writing it is I've been following the climate science for quite some time. And this is where the environment comes back in. And we don't have a lot of time left to shift things. And if we don't, we are gonna have major, major suffering um, as a humanity, like me mega fires, mega storms. Um, you know, the, the sea is already rising um, all over because of glaciers. There is a huge fire that is happening in Oregon two hours from me. It's, uh, I forgot what it's called. They all have different names. It's something with a B. I forgot the name of it. I was looking it up last night thinking, oh, it's only two hours away, Carly, it's growing. This is the worst drought we've had in many, 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 many years. And so that is a consequence of how we've been doing business. The, the aspect of consumption. It's the bootleg fire. Say that again. The bootleg fire. Yes, thank you. The bootleg fire, yeah. Um, so I wanted to be part of that change. And my nephew, who was four years old at the time, um, right before I really started writing the book and then got the book contract, he and I were playing one day and he looked at me and he said, Auntie Carly, <laughs> will you help me save the oceans? And I still feel tears saying this because I thought, yeah, this is something I really care about, something I really worry about. And how horrible that this is the future he's inheriting because of what we've been doing, consciously or unconsciously. And so I, um, I haven't actually chosen to have children because of what I know is at stake. And a lot of young folks are choosing not to have children because they don't know what kind of a world we have. We're, but we have an opportunity, we have a responsibility, we have choice. And this is the difference between consciousness and unconsciousness. When we're unconscious, we go into these automatic habits and patterns that may not be serving us, may not be serving others. But if we can slow down, if we can meditate like what we just did, and we bring in the inner game of self-awareness and presence, we say, I'm not choosing that again. I'm not choosing that plastic single use bottle again, because I know what happens to that bottle. I know that goes into the ocean. I know that's creating microplastics. I know that that's you know, harming all the marine life, right? Um, I'm not gonna choose a straw just because it's given. I'm actually gonna say, no, no thanks for the straw. Or there's so many choices that we can be making about what we're buying, who we're buying from, where our money is invested. There's so many, you know, things that we may not be fully conscious of that we're actually supporting, that if we were really looking at it, we go, oh my gosh, that chocolate bar I really like, they're actually engaged in human trafficking to get me that chocolate bar. That's a no, that's consciousness, that's a choice. Well, and you know, what you're saying reminds me of even just a few minutes ago when I, I went to default to Amazon. Um, and, um, and it's, because it's easier to default to Amazon than it is to say, Wait, I you know, and uh, I I don't I'm not I don't know enough to, to have a point of view on Amazon. I know some friends in my life have chosen to not purchase things from Amazon further, um, and I actually have one friend who has eliminated Amazon from her world altogether because she doesn't feel like Amazon's good for the world um, and good for humanity. So you, a person can make do their own research and make their own choices there. Um, but I love that your conscious reminder to say well, let's focus on 
small owned businesses, your, your local bookstore, or you know, the one that, as I mentioned, that, that would be better for me to go to is, hey, let's put up the black owned bookstore list. Um, Cause I believe in that, you know, in supporting community support, supporting black owned businesses. Um, so, uh, so that it's just a reminds, a reminder of like, even, even someone like me who tries to be conscious about this, you know, I don't always get it right either. Um, well, and, I, and, I, I, go ahead. And, and none of us do. And, and, you know, by the way, I don't think Amazon is, is, is bad. They are actually, um, Jeff Bezos's ex-wife is apparently writing tons of checks to support, you know, the healing around, um, racial injustice, uh, right before the pandemic, um, Bezos committed $10 billion towards climate change. So this is the opportunity and the responsibility that folks like you and I, and frankly, consumers can say, I'm not buying that product unless you do it this way. And so we can actually help businesses shift to be forces for good, to make sure that the products they're putting out into the world are for the good of all, you know, of people, of planet, that's, that's where we're headed. I see that happening again and again and again, but it requires consciousness and it requires, again, that, that strong inner game that supports us to be courageous and to speak up because if we don't speak up, it's complicity. We're just going along to go along. Maybe it's not our intention, but by not speaking up, we can't change it. And yeah. that's part of, I think, the conscious inclusive leader. And I know that's, that's the hardest part for folks. I hear it again and again and again. It's hard to challenge. It's hard to speak up. It's hard to give feedback um, because if I do that, then that person, may react in a negative way. There might be conflict that I might lose that relationship. And just like we have a need to survive, you know, to have clean water, shelter, food, we also have a deep need for belonging. And so when we speak up, it threatens that we may not have that belonging with that family, with that friend. Um, and just to speak personally, you know, there, there are a lot of relationships that strengthened for me in the course of the pandemic. And then there were relationships that were bringing me a lot of suffering again and again and again, because every time I spoke up, we weren't able to come together. And so I stopped investing in those relationships because as much as I wanted them to shift and change and kept inviting that, if the other folks aren't meeting you halfway or they don't have the skills and they're not willing to grow them, then that's kind of keeping me stuck, so to speak. And I would imagine I'm bringing that example because I know I'm not the only one that was experiencing that in the last year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think just offering something for me over the last year that, um, which maybe falls a bit more to the inclusive side of the conscious inclusive uh, spectrum is, you know, I have been a diversity, equity and inclusion professional. I might argue 20 plus years. I can say certainly confidently for the last seven plus years since I've really moved into this space. Um, and if you would have asked me 18 months ago, my confidence levels and knowledge around the space, I would have felt pretty confident. And I would have, I had learned at that point enough to know that I didn't know it all. Um, but wow, the, the work that I've had the opportunity to do um, to understand the systems of oppression that exist, um, uh, you know, since the murder of George Floyd have changed my perspective in so many ways and have challenged me to be consciously inclusive at different points in my in my life and different decisions that I get to make. And um, and, I, and I have people that I ask to be the, the keep me honest people. Um, so if you see me veering from my, my committed path, nudge me back if you, if you don't mind, because I know that I need help. Um, it's been um, both um, 
you know, it's sad and it's break, it breaks my heart to have to learn some of these lessons and messages, but some of the that you were just sharing around understanding the choices that we make individually and collectively that impact our planet and the environment that we all live in um, and our, our ability to influence change. Um, I think, you know, how we treat each other and understanding the systems of oppression that exist that were, are so ingrained. I, I keep referring to them as they're in, invisible and self-perpetuating. We don't even know they exist. So you have to become aware of them. Um, and it's, and by the way, when you learn about them, they're, it's people. it doesn't feel good. <laughs> um, and yet it's so important. And I'm grateful that I've had a chance to do that work. So Carly, you bring um, the, this book and, and, and the book is, is an outcome of work that you've done for years. Uh, so, you, you know, you bring in tools and, and workspaces and leadership teams to help them um, leverage the, the concepts and the insights and the messages there. Um, you know, we have, we have about uh, less than 15 minutes left. And maybe we, would you like to take us through maybe one of the activities? Is there something that would be fun for us to, to do together and learn about what we might experience in, in uh, the world of Carly Hauk? <laughs> sure, sure. Well, we, we could definitely explore an exercise and experience. And that's what I feel so excited about for those that are, are listening. Brian and I are putting together a really incredible three-day retreat where we're going to go deep into all these practices and really be able to come out with more embodiment of what it is to really look and feel um, and show up as a conscious inclusive leader and we'll have you know time to really go into all of these so there is that integration um, but let's talk about triggers you know, <laughs> I think I think that one is is an important one to navigate because I'd love to just give folks a, um, a an experience of it. So, just to kind of give a little context, self awareness um, is one of the first inner game skills that I talk about. So, self awareness is being aware of our thoughts, our feelings, our body sensations, and that supports us to have greater self management when a trigger arises that allows us to have greater other awareness and then relationship mastery so those those four pieces that i just named self-awareness self-management other awareness and relationship mastery are the four dimensions of emotional intelligence and i feel that in this remote distributed hybrid future of work that quality of self-awareness emotional intelligence is going to be even more needed because we're not necessarily with each other. We, we are going to be needing to hold the space more um, and check in with each other more and, and forge those connections um, and therefore have greater empathy. So let's imagine that there is an experience that you have had, because I'm sure we can all pick one and not just imagine it, where there was some challenge, there was some difficulty, let's say in the, in the last week, maybe it was this morning, maybe it was yesterday. And just bring your attention to something that was challenging that you had with another human being, an interaction, an encounter. And on a scale of one to 10, just recognize like, how triggered did you feel? And triggered, not everybody loves that word, but triggered basically means like, I'm feeling agitated. I'm feeling frustrated. I'm feeling maybe reactive is another word. Um, on a scale of one to 10, one being, I feel cool as a cucumber. I am not phased by this at all. 10 being, I have steam coming out of my ears. I am so enraged right now, right? And everything is welcome. So just noticing what's your number as you're reflecting on this situation. And now um, just noticing like what's happening in your, in your body. What are the physical sensations as you're recalling this situation? So what's the emotion? 
the emotion, the sensation, and there might be many feelings. There could be impatience, there could be frustration, there could be sadness, there could be fear. And just acknowledging, welcoming it all in, because that helps us start to regulate just by knowing what's here. The body starts to calm down and stay in the body. Try not to go into story because the story just gets us all revved back up again. Just stay in the body. Notice what's happening in the body, the sensations. Like for me, I feel this tightening in my tummy. I'm just being aware of that. And I'm not needing it to be any different than what it is. And then let's go into the thought. Um, how can I support myself best right now? Which might be that you take a well being break or that you say, you know what? Hey, I'm feeling triggered right now. I need like 10, 15 minutes before we come back into conversation. Um, or you might decide that because this is something that happened in the past, you actually need to have a conversation with this person to maybe set a boundary or to invite a certain type of connection or to share a feeling and a need, right? That would maybe support you best. And so just taking all of that in, and then I'd actually love to just hear from folks um, in the chat. So I'm going to just ask those questions again, if folks are willing to share. What was your number on a scale of one to 10? What was your number of being triggered? A nine, a seven, an eight, a six, seven, eight. Seven. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. So those are all high numbers. <laughs> and so why I say that, and I'm kind of giggling, um, is that whenever we are at a five or above, that's typically a sign that we've moved out of our heart. And we're in our head. Okay. And our head often has a lot of negative chatter and can often be leading from fear versus from love. It's so good if we can come into our bodies um, and be in our bodies when we're having these conversations. So there's nothing wrong. You've done nothing wrong, but this is not a time to have a conversation. You're too triggered. You need to calm down. You need to calm down. You need to come back into your body. And when you come into your heart for yourself, you can have self-love, self-compassion, self-forgiveness. This is that inner game again. When we bring it towards ourselves first, no matter what the other person did, they're just being a messy human, just like us, we can have compassion for them and we can hold a boundary and we can say no and we can invite connection. And this allows us to actually show up again as a conscious inclusive leader, person human, because we're being skillful. We're saying, oh, if I have a conversation right now, this probably is not going to go well. It's like driving a car, you know, you're like driving the car of yourself. And if you're really reactive and angry and fearful, you're probably going to have an accident. <laughs> and sometimes you just say, pause, I'm going to pause. What am I feeling? What do I need? What's the next best step? Um, so I, the next thing um, is that I'll just leave the acronym, um, which is NEST of what we just did so that you can really take it into a regular practice for yourself. You can share it with others. I wrote an article a few years ago for Conscious Company Magazine, um, which I think is something like how to be with anger at work and it was one of the most read articles of that year. And I talk about this process and this practice and this practice is in my book as well. And I've brought it into so many companies and with so many leaders. And as best I can, I practice it. Um, 
but I'm also a messy human and I'm not always responsive or mindful. And Brian knows this <laughs> because I've shared deeply with him like some of the challenges I've had in the last two years. Um, and, but it is a really wonderful practice. So NEST is the acronym. So N stands for the number. What, what's my number? One to 10. E is the emotion. What am I feeling right now? S is the sensation in the body. We want to come into the body because we don't want to get so um, revved up in story because the story just activates our nervous system again. And then what, what's the thought that would support me in the next step right now? Like, what do I need? How do I best support myself? So there it is. Thank you, Brian. Absolutely. Well, hey, I'm a messy human too. Hashtag messy human, um, and and certainly have have my own own moments. And um, you know, I, it's the, the I have my the version that I um, of a tool that I use in our programs. Uh, Hummingbird is um, uh, it's called practice the pause. So when you feel yourself, and I guess I think it would be when you're in that five to ten range there of just okay this is time to practice the pause um and uh the questions that i ask myself and, and and encourage others to ask is does it need to be said does it need to be said right now does it need to be said by me can i say it with love care or respect depending on the scenario that might be, you have a few options there um and can i say it in a way the other person can hear it um, and uh, by the way, almost every single time, and I think it actually is every single time that I start asking the questions, the answer is no. <laughs> I don't need to say it. Um, and, uh, and actually what it usually does is it allows me time to, to reflect and to process and to move out of head into heart as you know and using the language that you shared with us which i which i really really appreciate um and to say okay there maybe there's a conversation i need to have. how do i have it in a way that is building bridges rather than burning them down um because what when i'm acting and responding in the intensity of my emotion i'm more apt to burn down the bridges um and i don't want to burn down the bridges i just i i but i'm a messy human <laughs> and sometimes i feel like i want to <laughs> Well, so, in our, I love that. You know, this is my neuroscience coming through again, but you, you know, our, our system and our brains were actually more oriented towards war than for love, because the way that we even evolved as hunter gatherers is, was very much a survival base, but that's the most primitive part of our brain. So we still orient towards the most primitive part and I'm pointing to it because that's literally the reptilian brain down here, but we have this wise brain that lives up here and it's cultivated over time through mindfulness, through building compassion, through having more empathy. Like we are actually able to change the nature of our brain by what we're paying attention to. That's neuroplasticity. So, so we have this ability to actually orient towards more love. Um, and that just requires commitment and practice. And I know in the last bit that we have, could we talk a little bit about our retreat and invite people to join us in that? We should, we should, absolutely, absolutely. Well, and you know, I think you know, what, what I'm excited about with this retreat, um, which is just really, a, and I'm just gonna use the segue from this, this hour that we've spent together. It's amazing yeah. how quickly it goes. It went is, really fast. Um, <laughs> it did, it did, yes. And someone, if you need to drop off, if you're with us, we certainly understand. We'll be sending some information out and links after the call, so stay tuned. Um, but I, you know, it, I've worked really hard over the course of my adult life to understand me as a human and understand how I how I can be a better human and and um, and I and that work has continues as it also has evolved and it's evolved into also how do I 
how do I treat other humans uh, well? And how do I amplify and elevate other humans? Um, and particularly those, particularly those that are the most marginalized and the most oppressed and uh, the most subject to systems of oppression. And, uh, and I'm really excited about this opportunity to, to immerse in a retreat experience, to, um, to be sort of conscious and fully present and 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 explore these conversations through another lens because I love the messages of your book and um, and as we've talked about we're going to really center around those messages and and the activities and the things that you already have, have tried and, and experience experienced in corporate environments and but we're going to do it in a, a nature setting so I'm excited about that what, what would you like to share with the group ah oh, thank you thank you well um, this is all in the link the consciousleadershipretreat.com but. Brian and I are going to be inviting um, up to 20 folks to join us uh, to, at this really beautiful place that is in the Blue Ridge Mountains in North Carolina. Um, it's in a town called Black Mountain, which historically actually was the Black community in this particular area of North Carolina. And there is literally like a beautiful freshwater creek that runs through the property. So after this year, you know, we were already feeling burnt out before 2020. Um, 60 to 70 percent of folks were feeling burnt out. But now after this year, those numbers are even higher. And in order to bring our best selves to work and to the world, we need time for connection to upskill, to um, have time to really be together to rest, to rejuvenate. And so September 24th, 25th, 26th, we will be gathering to be able to really go deeper into these practices for nourishment, for expansion, for integration. We'll be really developing a strong inner game and having the ability to practice these tough conversations um, in a safe place and where we can really foster what I hope is like lifelong connection, community. Um, and I'm just so excited to bring you all together. I used to teach conscious leadership retreats for women leaders at this really beautiful eco lodge in Mexico for four years prior to writing the book. And then I took a pause. So inviting people into these more immersive transformative experiences is one of the things I absolutely love to do. And I was just so excited to get back into it and so excited to do this with Brian, a person that I really have come to appreciate um, and just love the way that you show up. So it's going to be amazing. Would love to have you. And we are giving, you know, scholarships for folks um, that might be a little bit more financially challenged. So, you know, you can reach out. We do have an application for you to apply. And we also are doing free consultation calls with Brian and myself so that you can learn more about what you're going to be taking away. You can share more personally about what you're wanting to grow and um, we can get you signed up. So we'd love to have you. It's less than, well, it's two months away, more than two months away. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Yes. And what, I mean, what could be better than spending a weekend in the mountains with Carly and Brian? Um, <laughs> I, well, I hope, I hope that you're, if you're listening, you're like, yes, I'd love to do that. And uh, you know, the, the thing though, I wanted to just add to what Carly's just shared and then, and then we probably should say goodbye as much as I hate to say goodbye uh, or what we should, we can see soon. Is, um, there's a program that we developed at Hummingbird called the diversity learning circle. And what we have really learned over the course of the last year as we've developed that and experienced that with, with leaders who are trying to understand how to be anti-racist or to understand how the systems of oppression that exist so they can combat those systems is that it does take immersing in spaces and having conversation and being vulnerable and really engaging in that dialogue um it, you have to do it you have to do that work to be able to do the work that, leave, that happens after that uh, which is really combating those systems and um, and then you continue to learn and you continue to have more conversation um, but there's no there's no fast pass to understanding how to be anti-racist or how to battle those so systems of oppression you got to just got to do the work so join us in the mountains um and uh we'll have some great food we'll have some time with nature and we'll learn and grow together. 
Yeah, there's a beautiful waterfall trail that I want to take you all to. So, yay. <laughs> well, uh, Carly, I often wrap up with, with encouraging everyone who's watching and listening to, to stay safe and be well. Um, I'd love to, to pass the baton, though, to you as our conscious guide uh, for um, just to wrap us up for the, for the for Hummingbird Hour today. Beautiful. Um, yeah, I would just say be kind to yourself. Um, take in and receive all the love in your life and then give it right back out because we all need more love and care. Thank you. We all need more love and care. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carly. We'll see you soon. Bye.